class 18 uh, for 4440 critical listening. Uh, it's going to focus on preamplifiers, um, and the following lecture will take a look at you know what some things you should be thinking about when purchasing a preamplifier and what it's actually doing in your system, um, and is it helping your sound or is it or is it the weakest link? So as we talked about, there's three main components, right? There's the source component, right? Um, there's this preamplifier component, and then there's the playback component. Um, so obviously the preamplifier receives signal from that source component. So we said that could be anything from a DVD player to a CD player, or even just your Pro Tools or the, the DAW that you're using. Um, the uses, uh, one of the biggest uses of a, of a, a stereo preamplifier um, is often to switch between sources. Uh, you can see this particular one here has the ability to, uh, it looks like it says phono, tape, tuner, and spare. Um, this seems to be a preamplifier that was probably created before digital technology. Uh, so the phono relates to um, a, a record player input, tape, obviously a, a cassette tape, tuner uh, being um, either it has a built-in antenna, it doesn't seem it does, so it's probably looking for some outside uh, antenna source, uh, and a spare could just be another input going into it. Um, so a routing is a big thing, and a preamplifier can be huge for that. Some of you may have in your little kind of DAW setups, you know, with audio interfaces, you may have a mixer involved, um, and that mixer may be your preamplifier. Uh, that ma mixer may be a very, very cheap uh, mixer, and therefore this uh, sort of, you know, intermediary stage of, you know, from source component to playback component, um, is probably the weakest link in your system. Um, it's also here to, to amplify the signal, um, especially if you're dealing with um, speakers uh, or, or, first of all, phono uh, preamplifiers, uh, pre um, or if you're dealing with systems that uh, you know uh, need to get up to line level, um, or source components that need to get up to line level. Um, it can also deal with channel balance, um, and most importantly, they usually have a big old volume knob. Some of the most simplistic ones, uh, you can see here, uh, this one here, the uh, Bel Canto seems to only have one knob. Um, so it's purely a volume control. Where this one you see has many other features uh, and uh, many other options. So you use the preamplifier the most and has a large influence on the system's overall sound. So you can see in this typical setup here, you have your sort of preamplifier there in the center, um, and all these source components are sort of going into it. You have a computer there, looks like some type of CD player, and then perhaps uh, another uh, DVD or CD player, all going into this preamplifier that then is feeding uh, another amplifier that feeds, uh, looks like some type of uh, passive uh, speaker system here. So uh, probably the most common preamplifier that you'd use today is a line stage uh, preamplifier. Um, it only accepts line level signals, so this would be ideal if you were just doing DVDs, Blu-rays, uh, any type of digital uh, line level source. Uh, turntables, record players are not at line level, um, so in order to uh, deal with that you would need a phono preamplifier. And that takes the very tiny signal from the phono cartridge and amplifies it to line level so that you could use it with your uh, line stage uh, preamplifier. Uh, this phono preamplifier can be part of the record player, it can be built right in. Obviously this one to our right is not an ideal record player, um, but or it can be integrated into a line stage preamplifier. Uh, if that's the case, then you get probably what is the most common uh, type of preamplifier in most high-end audio systems, which is the full functional am amplifier, or full function amplifier. Uh, it can accept both line level and phono level signals. Um, and so what is a great example of a full function amplifier? Well, uh, probably something that we've already looked at here in this PowerPoint slide, uh, and a mixer uh, would probably uh, fall under that category as well. It has uh, phono, mic, and line inputs. 
So how do they actually work? Uh, basically, the input of your preamplifier is a buffer between preamp and driving components. Uh, it's usually taking a high impedance to a low impedance. Uh, there's a, a gain stage with, within the, the preamplifier, uh, and this actually boosts the signal. And then your output stage, uh, drive interconnects and a power amplifier input uh, active mo monitors. Um, so um, it can either you know, drive uh, an amplifier that then is driving speakers, or in the case of active speakers, it can go directly to those speakers. Um, the volume knob seems to be the you know sort of you know main centerpiece for 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 most uh, preamplifiers, um, and most of them um, or some of them utilize a variable resistor. Um, and you might remember this from your electronics class. Basically, um, your your changes in resistance uh, will affect the output or the perceived uh, volume that we're going to hear. As you can see, this knob down to the right goes up to eleven. Thank you, Spinal Tap. Uh, volume knob can also be uh, can be uh, can utilize an integrated circuit approach. Uh, this doesn't uh, create as smooth of a, a, a sort of increase and decrease in sound, um, but it is a much cheaper um, and uh, much cheaper way uh, of creating volume changes. You can see here it's based on the integrated circuit. It's either going to R1, R2, R3, or R4. Um, and that then affects the amount of resistance and therefore um, what's uh, driving this amplifier and its output. There's a great uh, sort of debate on, well, is, you know, are tube amplifiers the better way to go? Is solid state a better way to go? There's a wonderful YouTube video. I put it here. I've also posted it directly onto the D2L uh, right after this presentation so you can kind of take a look at it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. They do a good job of making it entertaining, but there's also a lot of a lot of great information about what a tube is, what it's actually doing to your sound, and how that's different than a solid state device. Uh, I think there's a lot of misinformation about this area, so I thought it would be great for you guys to take a look at that video about it. So the only other really, you know, or, or the main issues when you're looking at how to choose your preamplifier, price is obviously a big part of it, but then this issue of features and simplicity and, and, and how that all works out together. Um, if you can see here, some of these preamps are basically just, uh, it looks like either a selector or a source knob, uh, or some of them are just even an input and output. One to the bottom left looks like it has a few more features. So most features in Q uh, occur uh, are included, usually are EQ and balance, uh, a tape monitor button, um, a mute switch, uh, some have a remote control, um, and look and feel is obviously a feature. Um, is the knob uh, nice and round or is there no knob and you control it via a remote control? Um, there's sort of two philosophies when choosing uh, a preamplifier too. Uh, there's the idea of purity versus enjoyment and on the right I would definitely say that is a very pure preamplifier. It's basically selecting sources, selecting a signal, and um, it's a it's you know applying level, um, very very transparent, very clear. If you look at this uh, uh, Sanyo uh, here on the left hand side, you can see there's all types of EQs, uh, buttons, knobs, balances that could really enhance the original recording. So this is not a, a open and shut case. You have to kind of think: Do I want something that's going to be extremely transparent but limited in what it can do? Or do I want something with lots of features that may, in fact, end up coloring the original performance quite a bit? This reminds me of some people's car audio systems, um, you know, how some goes to such great length to create all these other tweeters and, and woofers within the car uh, that really, really drastically changes uh, the original recording, but changes them in a way that makes them sound fantastic in a car. If music can sound fantastic in a car. Uh, there's other things to consider too, the number of inputs uh, and source components that you could uh, put into a certain device. If you look this one on the left here, I'm not sure how many options there are, but it seems that out on the left there, there's quite a bit more. 
Um, so really, the best way to compare uh, is, you know, go to Guitar Center again. Uh, maybe if you're, I don't know, really slumming it, you could go to Best Buy. Um, but the best way is to compare, you know, the different uh, the different systems. Um, what's really great are the uh, places that'll let you conduct a bypass test. Um, I think once again, Vintage Audio Kings they'll allow you to conduct a bypass uh, audio test, and you know uh, you can read more about um, the bypass audio test uh, in the Harley. Um, it's in uh, it's going to be under Chapter Four, um, uh, where he talks about preamplifiers. Um, and conducting a bypass test. Um, basically, it's you know taking one piece of gear and another piece of gear, uh, feeding a similar source component to both, and being able to sort of A B between the two. Um, so I would definitely recommend that if you are testing out a preamplifier or some type of mixer that you're going to put after your uh, you know your audio interface or maybe directly after a CD player or some type of laptop. Um, that um, you know, you allow yourself the ability to conduct a, a, a bypass test on one of these preamplifiers. Most high-end places that are you know mom and pop shops, uh, even vintage Audio Kings, uh, they'll allow you to to run a, a bypass test and uh, would usually set up a meeting, a specific meeting time, and allow you to uh, run one and then ask them questions. So this about does it, I believe, on preamplifiers.